Welcome to a presentation of another judge from the Legal Challenge. Today we have a legend, Paul Gardner, joining us from, is it London, Paul? London, yes. Joining us from London, and you can see that he's got the most trustworthy background in the Zoom. I'm not sure <laughs> if it's a picture or if it's the real thing, but uh, that's, uh, you can see some board games, so definitely mm. uh, an IP lawyer but also some probably like accounting books I can see, or at least some bills or something. So he's a well-organized lawyer. Uh, how, how, uh, how is the UK after Brexit in general, Paul? We're still alive. Uh, we still have food um, <laughs> so far. So on the face of it, not much has changed, but that will happen over time, I feel. Uh, do you do you see any changes in the games industry in the way that the games industry works? Is it like is we hear about the red tape, the queues of trucks, the food deliveries, <laughs> but uh, I know we deliver digitally. So did anything change for for games companies operating in the UK? Um, at present, not a lot. I don't think. Um, I suppose there have been some peripheral changes, which is uh, some organisations have needed to. Uh, establish some, albeit very small, presence in continental Europe. Um, there have been some issues around, you know, appointing a nominated uh, person for privacy purposes and these kinds of things. Um, but relatively limited. I mean, I think probably the biggest single concern the games industry has had with Brexit is the impact it may have on its ability to recruit and retain talent. Because so many of the people who work in the UK in the games industry are not from the UK. They're a lot of them from the EU. Well, I mean, I heard some people say that, yes, they are concerned. And other people said that the London rents have gone down somewhat with so, so many people living. I don't know if it's a pandemic mm -hmm. effect or not, but uh, at least like the friends I have who are not British and who work in London, they're all pretty happy. They're like, we're not moving. No way. It's great. Like London is great. So, uh, yeah, I don't see much of an exodus, put it that way. Um, and in fact, if anything, rents are rising, strangely. Uh, prime, prime London rents are going up, which I don't understand at all. But you would think, particularly in view of the pandemic more than Brexit, with some organizations scaling back on their know uh, size of property um but there seems to be no shortage of demand so make of that what you will <laughs> well uh, at least now uk is even more special in the sense of you know when we talk about the european law and mm. the uk law uk becomes this mm -hmm. thing uh could you briefly tell us when did you start with the games industry and uh, I know that you raised and educated a number of games industry lawyers, some of mm -hmm. whom you have brought back into the fold. I mean, they had their, you know, time out and you kind of merged them back. Uh, but uh, when did you start in, in the technology or in the games? Oh. Uh, how long have you got? This goes back a while because <laughs> I'm going to sh show my age here. Um, so, so very briefly, I suppose, my... I've always been interested in games, and you can see a few examples in terms of tabletop games, not just the playing of them, but the sort of thinking behind them. Um, I, I've created a few of my own games as a, as a teenager, which were just horribly complicated. I mean, just no fun at all, unless you like poring over densely written books of rules, which kind of pointed <laughs> its, its way towards my future career, I guess. Um, <laughs> but in the sort of Towards the end of my time at school, it was when um, we had things like the uh, BBC Micro and the ZX8081 Spectrum coming out. So it was a big interest in digital technology and sort of the very early sort of start of consumer gaming, if, if you like. Um, uh, because I was interested in writing long books of rules for games, I became a lawyer. Um, but then as a, a junior lawyer, I was involved in sort of some sort of digital technology related transactions. But but when I was a junior lawyer, what that meant was a big retailer buying a an IBM mainframe computer. You know, so there are issues about how we'd arrange the parking for the crane to deliver this mainframe computer into the office and things like that. So this is really kind of early, early days. But then one day um 
the partner in charge of a bigger uh, account that we were working on got a call from the guy who was running this business and he said, oh, we, in our group of companies, there's a, there's a company that does computer games and they've got a problem. Can you send someone to go and have a chat? So because I was young, I was interested in digital technology, I was sent across to see this little games company. I think I was the first person they'd ever seen wearing a suit. Um, and even as a junior lawyer, as they started to talk about their problem, it quickly became clear that it was a fairly significant problem. And it turned out they were part of the licensing chain that was involved in the game Tetris. And they had a license from a Hungarian company, which had a license from the Soviet agency that then controlled the rights in Tetris, on the back of which they grant a license to the old Atari. And long story short, what you had were two exclusive, apparently exclusive licensees for the Nintendo Entertainment System version of Tetris. So I had to go back to report the company three weeks later that they had uh, litigation in the UK, California, oh, and the form, um, what was then the Soviet Union. Um, <laughs> so that became effectively a year of my life. So I, I wasn't and still not a litigator. But because I got involved in, in sort of understanding the arrangements and the, you know, the people, I was very heavily involved in all that process. So I said that took about a year uh, or more probably. Um, and at the end of it, we got through it. Company was okay, survived. It was then going through this huge growth between sort of the 8-bit to 16-bit platform. Um, and because they'd had this big legal issue, I became a de facto in-house lawyer for them. I mean, 80 plus percent of my time was working for this games company. And uh, it was pretty intensive, but really enjoyed it. And I began to think, you know what, this is a lot more interesting than buying IBM mainframe computers for retailers. And also, there weren't very many other lawyers I'd come across who knew anything about the industry. So I kind of went from there. And over time, an increasing part of what I did led to the games industry. Um, and then I made it more an active sort of priority and quietly started to drop other things. So that from the last, for the last I don't know, 20 plus years, it's been pretty much everything I do or in other words, relating to the games industry, which, which is great. I think that that gives you a unique perspective on the evolution of the whole thing in the sense that mm -hmm. a lot of things that we learn are things that we inherited. So, and as always, it's a problem is that we inherited it from, let's say, three years ago. Imagine someone graduating this year from law school and hearing about loot boxes. And to them, mm -hmm. loot boxes always existed, always were a part of the mm -hmm. whole thing. And like privacy and loot boxes, yeah, sure, like it's a, but we come from the age where there were no loot boxes. So we saw them <laughs> being born. We had all those discussions as the similar to, you know, uh, football sticker albums or not and how and so on. Yeah. So, so I think it's like super great that you can go back to the birth of the whole thing and then understand how this involved the end user consumer, you know, agreements and everything. Just like people who buy games on Steam and they think Steam always was there, but actually, nope. And, yeah. you know, they have law cases uh, to prove it. <laughs> uh, things are not really taken for granted. Uh, so, so basically, I think that gives you the perspective of why it is the way it is right now not necessarily logically but how it got there you know why you know this is the borders of poland and why this is the uh, you know former soviet union uh same same for us you know reading now on the crane in poland and realizing how recent the whole current arrangement mm -hmm. is and if you look back 100 years ago then okay you know vilnius is polish and uh, the capitalism Kaunas, and then if you look at the crane, so like really, really recent things. But when we grew up, we thought, okay, this is it. This is how it is. Um, in your perspective and in your experience, what makes a good games industry lawyer versus a tech lawyer? Is there a difference? Can you say that any tech lawyer from Silicon Valley can be a good games lawyer because they're into new things and emerging technology and they're you know, going where no law exists and they create law, or or there's something that tech doesn't have that the games industry has? Yeah, it's an interesting question because I suppose I grew up as a tech lawyer, albeit in the early stages of tech 
industry. Um, but what became increasingly apparent to me is that the games industry, although has grown out of and is still very reliant, if you like, on tech, is an entertainment business. And that there's this fusion of tech and entertainment. Uh, so in its in the core creation of a game, of course, it's still very tech heavy, albeit, you know, tech such as Unreal has somewhat democratized the game production process, but it's still a very, you know, tech heavy industry. And I think sometimes even talking to other lawyers, they, they fail to appreciate that the development of a big game is a very material software development project. So the, the, the tech is still there, but in so much of, you know, the, the way the, the industry has developed, it has sort of features and relationships with, with the wider entertainment world. Um, and one can see that coming out in, in numerous ways, um, you know, both in terms of the content of certain products, the crossover with film and TV and so forth and music. And, um, and as content becomes, you know, a bigger and bigger sort of part of, of, of the process. And so, um, tech on its own isn't enough. Um, similarly, entertainment industry knowledge on its own isn't enough. And I think it is a unique fusion of technology and entertainment. So I think somebody coming purely from a tech perspective risks failing to appreciate the entertainment spectrum, if you like, that the games industry now operates in, whether that be content or funding or relationships and so on and so forth. Um, similarly, the entertainment industry still fails to completely get the computer games industry. There was a stage when I thought the entertainment industry would almost devour the games industry. And as we know, some of the big entertainment companies have made various attempts to, to do that, and some rather less successful than others. And you've had companies you know, who've come in and gone out and come in and gone out, still don't really know what to make of the games industry. Um, some have been more successful. Um, whereas now, I think we see the games industry starting to almost take over the entertainment industry. And if you think of a product like um, the Unreal Engine, you know, the ability, increasing ability to use something like Unreal in the creation of, of, of wider entertainment products is, I think, going to be a big game changer for the entertainment industry. Well, I mean, so so what what you're saying is basically, uh, uh, I, I think that the best illustration I think you've given the example uh, that I was looking for is that we had this huge movie companies or book companies at some stage, if you look at the German industry, uh, with mm -hmm. great revenues and resources coming in and saying, we're going to have 200 people doing this. We're going to have 300 mm -hmm. people doing this. And then, boom, nothing. Like five years later, six years later, uh, there are some examples uh, that are successful. If you look at uh, Warner in London, yep. uh, if you look at Traveler Tales, and again, like Lego making very successful conversion into the virtual world and being you know on steam and everywhere but then for every successful story like this there's i don't know dozens of huge companies that wanted to be in but really didn't have one and then we had the same thing with the netflix of video games <laughs> where a few years ago it, 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 it seemed like okay the industry will collapse no one will purchase games anymore everyone's going to be you know this yeah. and then the free-to-play thing that everything has to be free and then this is how it goes but then then actually not really you know you get people making hundreds of millions of premium games so mm -hmm. those waves are coming and going and i think that to me the lawyers that mm, the big law firms that did not succeed in becoming important in the games industry similar to the big film companies not really succeeding in being a part of the games industry mm -hmm. sure you have the size you have the funding you have you know smart people but something doesn't really click and then you know that's that's mm -hmm. the way it is uh so at your current firm how international you guys are vegan has offices where is it uk europe ireland so we're just uk and um, brussels so we're we're not a large firm um just to give you some idea we're kind of like 150 160 people um so we're certainly by london standards you know, very small um the, the challenge, um, I think, for law firms generally, and it goes to the, your last point, um, 
is how do you best service and work with sort of game games companies? And unlike probably all the other entertainment sectors, the the the, the interest as a lawyer and, and as a, a games industry observer is that success can emerge right across the size spectrum. And as you say, you've got you know, the firms, the companies like the the, the Warmers, um, who've done incredibly well with the games industry, plus the sort of big um, games companies themselves, whether it's the EAs, Activisions, and so forth, one end of the spectrum. But then you've got teams of you know five people like Coffee Stain who you know come out with this incredible success. If you are a sort of really big law firm, you struggle. I mean, uh, more than struggle, I think, to work with those sort of small independent studios you, you just can't offer something that that's going to work for either party so you almost have to say to yourself well we can't be in that market we will just act for the big players doing the mega m a deals and that's what we'll do and that's fine and that's you know great great business for law firms um but it misses out a lot of what's really interesting that's going on in the games industry um so i quite uh, I quite like being a firm which is fairly agile. We're you know, small enough to be able to work with the five-man or less studio, um, but we can take people on the journey, you know, through uh, investments and M&A and help them with uh, disputes, heaven forbid, or all the other things. Um, what we won't do is is the sort of ten billion dollar plus mega M&A deals, but. They're, they're great business, but they're not the most interesting work, to be honest. Well, I think you're like the GB doctor who sees the whole picture, who has the deeper understanding. And then there are, mm. you know, specialized doctors. And if you have a problem with the knee, then you go to the knee guy mm. who's doing knee surgery every other day. But uh, maybe he will not even understand why you're having a knee problem. He can fix your knee, but then you have to talk to someone who can understand the the whole process. How come you guys have an office in Brussels? Is it recent? Is it has been it always like this? What's the focus of Brussels? It's office? been we've had an office in Brussels for some time, and that has grown out of the work the firm does in this the motion picture industry um, and sort of audio visual uh, services type work. So that's the sort of genus of the office. More recently, it's grown significantly with um, more IP lawyers joining, and that's more a Brexit phenomenon because we needed IP lawyers in Brussels to be able to service uh, sort of IP work on a pan-European basis. So um, Brussels so office is, is more or less taking care of the whole European matters for you guys. Yeah. So you've met uh, Ted Shapiro, who's come to summit, who is sort of the uh, a sort of guru on European copyright law. Um, and he's American who, originally, or not? He's American, yes, that's right. Yeah. So um, he's, okay, so he's an American <laughs> part of the British company working in the Brussels office. Okay. I know. Make us that what you will, yes. Um, so he's been a really helpful resource on sort of you know European copyright related matters. Um, and and you recently. Uh... Picked up, acquired, combined, uh, took over uh, <laughs> Mr. Purewell and his team. We did, yes. Yeah, so attendees of the summit will, will know Jazz and probably also his colleagues, uh, Pete Lewin and Isabel Davies. And uh, they joined us at the end of October last year. Uh, as people may not know, but Jazz and I used to work together a number of years ago. Um, Again, it's going back some time, but when I was uh, uh, sort of thinking about things early one year, I began to become aware of this chap called Jazz Purewell of another firm. He was starting to publish some stuff about the games industry, which um, I had to admit was really quite good. So we got to know each other, and I said to Jazz, well, why don't you come and join us? So he did. Um, we uh, spent a year or two working together. He spent some time in, um, in California working with, but we were both at Osborne Clark in those days. He was at OC's office in California. I think he got the entrepreneurial bug when he was out there. So he came by promptly handed in his notice and set up his own law firm. Um, but uh, we've been sort of been very close ever since then and uh, worked together a bit on various things. And so it kind of made sense for them to come over to us. And it um, partly goes back to some of the things we talked about before, which is um, it was the games industry being a very sort of uh, 
entertainment focused business as well as just pure tech, having lawyers who are specialists in music, or film, um, Becky and gaming, sadly now, uh, and other areas meant that I think they felt they could do more with the people that they were working with. And uh, I think that's worked out very well. I think they, uh, his team represents exactly the values that you have. Uh, they're just the younger version of yourself, I would imagine, in the sense that they Much have younger. Uh, yeah, to me, to me, they have keen interest in the product. Uh, they mm. understand the product. They're very excited about the product. And I think to any developer, it's just so uh, easy to work with a lawyer who understands what you do, as opposed to you know yeah. talking to a bank and trying to every time we go to the bank, we have to explain what we do, and then the, ultimately the question comes: Is it the same as gambling? And you're like. No, like this is gambling, this is gaming, you can also call it games. Oh, okay, so you don't like take money from players. Well, we take money from players, but the the whole like the whole mechanism is different. Mm -hmm. We're based on a different instinct. We give fun and not really exploit, but then okay, yeah. So every time you meet someone at the financial institution, they have this gambling, gaming, games, is it the same thing? No, it's not. So when you talk to his team, I really enjoyed the fact that they are you know they are inside. They 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 know the you know it's it's similar to to a lot of people in the industry and the big companies. When you meet someone who's uh, managing large revenue streams, and before that mm -hmm. they've been at Coca Cola, and after that they'll go to different companies, so they don't get it. And then you meet some people who joined the game st studio because they love it, and they're gonna stay there for ten years, and you know that the guys will will succeed. Uh, as a judge in the legal challenge. What do you think you're looking for in the stronger teams? Like which, so which uh, skills you will think are more? Uh, let, let me rephrase it. Um, what do you think is the weakest thing that a team can do during the challenge? And what do you think is the commendable thing that you would say? Okay, even though you guys made some mistakes, I think because of that you deserve the. Uh, the high points. Um, well, so I suppose picking up on your last point, um, before getting into the challenge, uh, if you think about what makes a good games industry lawyer, um, you talk about understand the products, and, and that is clearly important. I think if I'm interviewing someone for a job as a junior level, fundamentally I want to see someone who's a really good lawyer or has the makings of being a really good lawyer because you can train and has an interest in the games industry i don't need to know about the games industry or all the side of products that's a bonus but you can teach people that more easily than being able to teach them to be a good lawyer and occasionally we've over the years you've had people come along and they've been super enthusiastic and super knowledgeable about the games industry and its products and they'll play know extensively and that's great but when you start to scratch the surface at the sort of legal bit of their uh, world it, it's, it's less impressive and that that kind of worries me because I, I think in the entertainment business as a whole you will get people who are what I call just pure fans and okay so we couldn't become a games developer I know I'll be a lawyer um, and that's the closest I'll get to or I couldn't be a singer but I'll do music law couldn't be an actor but I'll do theatre law or whatever um, and so that's always a bit of a worry. Um, I need people to be really, really able lawyers, you know, good analytical skills, attention to detail, et cetera, et cetera, all the things you'd want from any lawyer in any specialism. So coming to your question, I suppose what I look for in the stronger teams are, or well, any team, but what comes out in the stronger teams is, I think, number one, complete mastery of the facts of the case and number two an ability to present their argument in a clear logical way and even if i don't fully agree with the argument if they're able to present it in a clear cogent logical way that carries them in a very long way and then beyond that i suppose then one does look at the strength of the argument you know does it does it kind of pulp make sense? And it, I mean, the, the caliber uh, of people I've seen on this competition over the years 
has been very, very strong. Um, occasionally, people put forward an argument that just, although very passionately and logically put forward, doesn't actually stack up at all. Uh, so that, that can be a problem. So I think that those things are the important things. What is important but less important in a way is the sort of uh, what you might call the commercial feel for the issues um, because commercial commercial sense is really good in sort of commercial transactions. When it comes to arguing a case in court and it's all about what the law is and there's a commercial element to it to it but it's it's a, it's a more secondary element to it I can put it that way I I like it, it's it's a very interesting uh, comment that you made about the uh, people who are passionate for games but are not really strong lawyers uh I've seen my share in 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 my experience I uh, you know without naming any names but most of these people ended up on business development because ultimately they got sort of uh, pushed out of the legal teams and uh, they're still happy uh, in the business teams uh, going meeting people being a part of the games industry just not giving their opinion and uh, if you look at the submissions to legal challenge first of all we get like this many and then maybe half of them come through with the memorandums in the sense that there is way more people who say I'd like to do it than people who are able to follow this up and write the memorandum and so on. And the explanations are uh, all sorts of explanations from we had a member of the team who was supposed to do it, but now he's not picking up his phone to <laughs> I thought I had the time, but now I have the exams coming, so I don't really have the time to like everything. So uh, the commitment, yes, you can see that if you ask all of them, I don't know, like 50 teams, they would all say, we'd like to be a part of the games industry. It's great. Okay, can you do the memo? Okay, half of them is gone. And then from the rest, uh, you can see that sometimes what, what, what you highlighted is the structure is lacking. It's a bit chaotic. Uh, it lacks certain outside perspective. If you give them the same memo three months later, they would say, mm, I don't get it. But yeah, I mean, you wrote it. So uh, yeah, maybe you should like, you know. So all of those skills that are not relevant to the games industry, but are relevant to just being a good lawyer, being able to structure stuff and be coherent in the front of your client or your own game studio. Uh, I think once we had a memo that was completely wild in the same the formatting, it was like, I don't like an email, not really as a memo. Mm -hmm. uh, it had some great points. Um, and the author of that memo now uh, works as a business development guy with his own agency. Uh, and I still remember that people were looking at this and is this a joke? Did he send us a draft? Is this really? Yes, yes, this is for real. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Well, I mean, did he go to law school? Yeah. Okay, well, uh, I think we should just politely respond that maybe it doesn't really work. Uh, so all of those like little things, but that's the skill set that a good lawyer brings to the company and to the studio. Uh, does it matter for you if uh, English is the native language of uh, games industry lawyers? Like, is, is it is it the big thing? Uh, no, um, obviously strong competencies in, in English is important and. I, I've been incredibly impressed at the uh, ability of candidates or participants who don't have English as a native language, the, the way they present their case uh, so well. Um, so no, it doesn't. It doesn't have to be um, a native language as long as they're competent it's, in it. It's. I think it's one of Tamara's warriors every year. Uh, when we do this chart, who gets which papers to grade? Uh, first of all, they become anonymous, they become a number, so I don't even know which number is which team. Mm -hmm. But we try to uh, follow the rule that the submission from the same country shouldn't go to the judge from the same country, uh, given the sense that maybe there's some implied BS that, I don't know, uh, that mm -hmm. I don't see the British English, but you will feel, oh, I don't know why, but this work just feels great to me. Yeah, it's just, I, I cannot put my <laughs> finger on this. So we want to avoid this and we try to mix and match. And then ultimately we forget who is who and then we look at this and like, which team is, okay, let me, let me, let me read. Okay. Yeah. Well, I cannot say where it comes from, like very hard. Uh, yeah. But this is not the case for the weakest uh, submissions. Like if you look at the bottom, like bottom five or six, uh, you can see that, okay, maybe the guys still have to, you know, learn how to articulate things. Uh, 
Um, so uh, in what three weeks we will have the uh, semifinals and then followed by the finals. Uh, all of the teams are coming to the next summit whenever it happens. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, we hope for September. We'll see how that goes. Uh, and I think it'll be a great way of broadcasting it, recording it, and you know, presenting those teams so that we can see this is the level, this is what it takes to be a games lawyer. Uh, and we hope you're a good judge. I mean, kind and considerate and, you know, I don't know, smiling, encouraging them. But um, mm -hmm. uh, should they expect from you any hard questions or you're the sort of a nice person who just uh, says, well done? And, and... Um, I, I don't go out of my way to ask questions for the sake of it, put it that way. So I've tended to ask only a very small number of questions when I feel there is something I really want to drill into. Um, I, I quite like to let candidates or participants present in the way that they've prepared and you know maintain their flow. Um, I, I want to see people do well, put it that way. I'm not I'm not there to make their life miserable. Um, I want them to, so far as possible, enjoy the experience and. Um, you know, benefit from it. Now, that said, I know there are judges who do like to quiz candidates more closely. Um, and that's not a bad thing because, you know, that does happen. So the ability to think on your feet and work around an interruption is, is an important skill. So I think it's good that questions are asked. Um, personally, though, I tend to like to let people get on and present in the way that they've prepared. Um, and only intervene if I really feel I, I I do want to check something. Is it is it a good sign for you as a lawyer when the judge is asking questions? Is it a bad sign or it's not related to how the case is going? So if I'm a team and I'm on this case and the judges mm -hmm. keep asking me questions, is it like, should I be concerned or I should just, you know, it happens. It doesn't really matter. I, I, I wouldn't be concerned. I don't. I don't think it's a sign um, that you're doing badly or anything like that. There are some judges whose style it is to ask a lot of questions, irrespective of how things are going. Um, and they will set out to plan to ask questions um, just to see how people deal with with questions. I think that's a, it's a good, good test. Um, and there are others, probably a bit more like me, who will tend to, to listen um, and again, you shouldn't read anything into that. You shouldn't think, oh, he's fallen asleep or it's really, you know, he's already sort of marked me down. So don't worry about that. Just get on and present and deal with any questions or lack of them uh, as best you can. That, that, I think that, that that's a strong recommendation to all the teams who will be second guessing or trying to understand if they should keep mm. talking if uh, they should keep talking until they're interrupted if they should keep talking until the judge starts to nod or you know trying to sort of modify on the spot uh mm. don't really don't like judges are different people are different the uh, mm. uh, impression will be different regardless of whether or not some people ask questions or not well Thanks a lot uh, uh, for being a part of it, for bringing your experience mm -hmm. to this competition, to to uh, help also the teams understand uh, their strong and weak points, and uh, really look forward to uh, seeing how different judges, um, you know, act in this digital mm -hmm. hearing that we are having for the first time, and whether or not you guys feel it's uh, more challenging than being in the real life, where you can look at people and coordinate uh sort of real body language as opposed to just mm -hmm. looking at the screen and uh, uh seeing i don't know if it will result in a more uh, aggressive panel or in a softer panel hard to say but uh Indeed. We'll, we'll see we'll see thank you very much paul and uh i have to say also thank you to all the wonderful people that you see right now on the screen these are the law firms and games companies that help us make the summit and legal challenge happen including uh, vegan that we discussed uh, just on this uh, video uh, mm. and I'll see you in the next uh, presentation